1 Samuel chapter 17, and I'm going to read verses 32 through 54. 32 through 54, I'm going to finish up this chapter this week. We spoke, uh, I spoke about uh, David and Goliath last week. I'm going to finish that up. And uh, the title of my message today is Who's Laughing Now? Who's laughing now? Let's look at verse 32. The Bible says here, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And David, or excuse me, and Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put on helmet of uh, uh, put and he put an helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail, and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou camest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou camest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take, the, take thine head from, from thee and will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine ro arose and came and drew nigh to, to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith and with the Philistine and when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel, of Judah, rose and shouted and, and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sha'arim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought, and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, and Lord, as we <clears throat> read this, this portion of Scripture and read this account, this history of David and his slaying of Goliath, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to, to recognize what was going on there. Help us to recognize uh, who was in the battle and help us to recognize who won the battle. 
And Lord, help us to glorify you in, in all of this. And Lord, help us to recognize that the battles that we're in, that you're there with us as well. Lord, I thank you so very much for all that you've done. Lord, I pray that you'd be with me this morning as I preach your word. Give me the words to say and the power to say them. And Lord, I just pray that you would help me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Who's laughing now? Have you ever been laughed at? Has anybody ever been laughed at? Right, one way or another. I think that we all have been laughed at at one time or another. Now, let me ask you another question. Have you ever been laughed at for obeying the Lord? You see, when David came to camp and caught wind of what was going on there in the camp, he started to show a little bit, I think, of his youthful exuberance. Um, and, and, and it's hard to say that, that, um, that, uh, that there wasn't any of that, that this was all David being, being full of faith and all of that. I think there was a lot of that youthful exuberance. He was excited and, 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 he, and he was right. There was a cause and something had to be done with this, with this Philistine, right? But the people started to laugh at him. Okay. His brother said, why don't you just go back and take care of those sheep that you left? Well, word even got back to Saul, and when Saul heard about it, he, he sent for David and had him, had him come up. You see, if you attempt to serve the Lord, people will probably laugh at you at some point on the, uh, along the way. At some point along the way, people are going to laugh and people are going to say, oh, you're foolish. And people are going to say, oh, it's never going to work. And people are going to, they're going to say all kinds of things. As we attempt to, and I say we because I'm involved with it. It's my, it's my family predominantly that is, is desiring to start the church in Breckenridge. And, and it's been something that they've wanted to do for a long time. It, it was something that I um, even, even thought about and talked about. I talked to my pastor in Michigan when I lived there about starting a work in Breckenridge. So it's been going on for a long time. But everybody has, has basically laughed at it. Everybody has basically said... That'll never happen here. It can happen. And, 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 and there's been all kinds of reasons. Every time you strive to do something for the Lord, somebody is going to come out against it. Somebody is going to laugh at it. Somebody is going to say that it can't be done. They're going to discourage you. They're going to try to get you to turn back and give up on such a crazy notion. Now, <clears throat> I, don't want to, I don't want to make this sound wrong. All right, because a lot of times it's Christians who say, oh, that's not going to work. But really, I, I want you to recognize that, that where this comes from, it comes from the hand of Satan. It comes from Satan trying to discourage you. It comes from Satan trying to beat you down. If you look at the, the, the story here and what's going on, some of the discouragement came from, from David's own family. Right? They weren't unbelievers. Some of the discouragement came from Saul. He wasn't an unbeliever. He was the king of Israel. But Satan was trying to distract him. Satan was trying to, to discourage him. You see, Satan uses the, these kinds of, of weapons in our lives. He uses discouragement. He uses humiliation. He uses our unbelief. He even drags up past sins and throws them in our face to try to discourage them, to, to try to discourage us. And he'll throw something back and say, how can you be used of God? Look what you've done. Look, what, look at your past failings and look at your, your frailties and look at all of these things that have happened. And Satan is going to try to throw them back in your face, even if it's only in your own mind. It reminds you of your inadequacy. He'll cause you to doubt. He'll cause you to fear. He'll cause you to worry. And, and, and all of this is in hopes that he's going to discourage you and to keep you from pushing forward and trying to be used of God. That's exactly what Satan was trying to do here. He was trying to discourage David. He was trying to push him down. He was trying to tell him to go away and go take care of those sheep. And you don't need to, you don't need to be here. He uses all kinds of things against us to get us to turn back. But David wouldn't be turned back. He wasn't going to listen to those things. The question is, 
Will you listen to them? The question is, will you be discouraged by those things? The question is, will you push forward and be used of God? This morning, I want to look at three different, um, three different points that I have. First of all, we're going to look at the man, the man, David. Look at verse 41. The Bible says in verse 41, And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. Goliath laughed at David. Goliath looked down uh, into that valley as David came forward, and he's thinking, Really? Is this the best you have? Right? Is this the man that you've sent out after me? Right? Um, he laughed at him. He thought it was funny. He was young. He was ruddy. He was of, of a fair countenance. Uh, the Bible tells us that, uh, I don't know, it doesn't really tell us exactly how old David was, but we can, re we can, we can get a few clues uh, from Scripture. Number one is that in, in Numbers chapter 1 and verse 3, it gives the age at which a man can be drafted into the army. That age was 20 years old. So we know that David was out with the sheep. We know that it was his three older brothers that had, had gone off to war with Saul. And so David being the youngest of, what was it, eight sons, right? Um, and and, and uh, so we, can, we know for sure that he was most likely below 20 years old and maybe quite a bit below, maybe 15 or 16 years old. It's hard to say. It doesn't really matter, all right? But he was somewhere in there. He was a youth, okay? He was young. He was ruddy. Ruddy means to be blonde or redheaded and of a light complexion, maybe even freckle faced. People always pick on people who look a little different. I'm sure when, the, when Goliath looked down there and he saw this, let's, let's call him a redhead, freckle faced little boy and maybe light haired or whatever it was. And he saw that he looked a little bit different than who he was used to hanging around with. He maybe even looked a little bit different than the rest of the Israelites out of there. And he started to, he started to laugh at him. You think, you've got to be kidding me, right? What is, what is this? He was of a fair countenance. David was a handsome young man, but he was just a boy. You see, there's a tendency for people to laugh at young men who've not proven themselves. There's a tendency for people to mock youth. Many times it's because youth take on a challenge that others have already given up on. They've already tried that. They've already done that. And they don't want to go down that road again. And many times it's like, oh, you young guys, you're just always trying stuff. Don't, don't, don't try to reinvent the wheel. We've already tried it. It's already failed and it's over. It's not even worth the effort so he laughed at him paul told timothy not to let anyone laugh at you because of your age he told timothy in first timothy chapter 4 and verse 12 let no man despise thy youth but be thou an example of the believers in word in conversation in charity and faith and purity what did, what did Paul tell Timothy? Listen, don't let them despise your youth. Don't let them laugh at you because of your youth. Go out there, be an example. Go out there and show them the way a Christian ought to live. Go out there and show them the way a pastor ought to pastor and the way a pastor ought to be. And, and lead those people the way God has told you to lead those people. Be an example. Ignore the laughing. Ignore the, the jokes. Ignore all of that stuff and be who God has called you to be. Well, you see, David was God's man for the job. David was the man that God had sent there to do that. It didn't matter that he was young. It didn't matter all of those things. God had sent them in there. Listen, if God has sent the man, don't second guess the man. If God has sent the woman, don't second guess the woman. I'm not necessarily talking about the pastorate, obviously, right? I'm not necessarily talking about ministry, obviously. But if God has sent someone to do a job, don't second guess them. Now, what I mean by that, all right, don't second guess as far as them being the right person. Now, obviously, we're all able to make mistakes. I'm prone to make mistakes. I probably make more than many of you make. Uh, and, and so that, uh, that's not what I mean by don't second guess them. What I mean is don't start thinking, oh, well, he made a mistake. He must not be the man for the job. If God has sent them, they are the person for the job. 
You know, I've, say, I've seen men and women second guess their own call because of some kind of adversity. I've seen people question whether this is the man that God has, has sent because there's some kind of trial or there's some kind of difficulty or there's some kind of... Some, listen, as far as the church is concerned, if you as a church have prayed about who God would send... If you as a pastor or, or missionary or evangelist or Sunday school teacher or whatever the case may be, if you have prayed about whether this is where God wants you and God has affirmed that this is where God wants you, then don't doubt that. Move forward. David was God's man. I believe that David knew that, that God had laid this on his heart. I believe that David knew that God had called him to this. God was challenging him, and David didn't doubt that he was the man. He told Saul, listen, God has protected me before. Remember last week I told you that David encouraged himself in the Lord by going back and drawing on those past experiences and saying, hey, God has protected me before and he will protect me again. God has delivered the lion and the bear into my hand and he's going to deliver this Philistine into my hand as well. David didn't doubt that he was the man. David knew that God had called him for that job, for that purpose. Did God call you? Did he send you there? Did God send you here? Has God given you something that he wants you to do? Don't doubt that you're the person. I've seen so many people doubt. Well, I'm just not sure that God has called me. Listen, God laid that on your heart. Maybe, I mean, there's a, there's a thousand different things. Maybe God is, has, has impressed upon you that, hey, we need to do this. We need to help with that. We need to take over that ministry. We need to teach this class. We need, to, we need to do that job at the church or whatever the case may be. Maybe it is that God has said, you need to talk to that person. You need to talk to that person. If you don't talk to that person about the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe nobody ever will. Don't doubt that you're the person that God has called. If he's laid it on your heart, move forward with it. If it doesn't violate scripture, if it is something that, that um, you know that God would want to have done, then do it, right? Don't doubt that you're the person that God has called. Right? Did God give you that Sunday school class? Did God direct you to this church? Did God, uh, did God call you wherever you are? All right, then go or stay. Be where God told you to be. Now, there, uh, has there ever been anyone who has called, who has answered the call. Let me, let me, I'm going to skip that, that, that point. I don't even want to make that point now. Uh, man, when God sends the man, he is the right man. Even though the world may laugh, even though everyone may wonder, he is still God's man. Stick with him. Everybody doubted David. Everybody thought, I, I mean, on, honestly, you see this young boy going out and that, that giant coming down the other side? Everybody there is saying, oh, this is going to be ugly, right? This is going to be really bad. Everybody was doubting David except for David and God. God knew he was the man. God knew what he was going to do. And God sent him down there. When God sends the man, stick with the man. Number two, look at the method. God is glorified in the method. Look at verse 38. The Bible says, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 38, the Bible says, And Saul armed David with his armor and put it on the helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail, and David girded his sword upon uh, his armor, and he essayed or attempted to go out, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proven them. And David put them off of him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now look down at verse 43. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou comest to me with staves? <clears throat> and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou camest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Goliath didn't only laugh at David, 
He didn't only laugh at this young boy coming down to meet him. He also laughed at his weapons. He laughed at the methods that David was going, was going to use. Many times the world laughs at our methods. Many times the world laughs at the way we do things in, in, in a biblical church. They laugh at the way we do things because God, you see, God instructs us in how he wants his work to be accomplished. God has given us the method. God has given us what he wants us to do. God has shown us as a church what we are to do today. Many churches have left the old-fashioned preaching in favor of, of something else, some kind of a program, some kind of a, some kind of a production, some kind of a, of a whatever else. Entertainment seems to be the, one of the most popular things. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter one, look at verse 18. I want to do this without losing my place. <laughs> First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.18, the Bible says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. To the, to the lost, preaching is silly. To the lost, preaching is foolishness. To the lost, it, it is something to be laughed at. Look at verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Now that would be the self-professed wise, right? And I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Look at this world thinks itself wise. This world thinks itself uh, as sophisticated, and it looks at what we do as Bible preaching preachers and Bible preaching churches and looks at us and says, you know, that's just so old fashioned. That's just so outdated. That is just so not 2020. You need to change. You need to do something different. But God has given us this method. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Preaching is the method that God honors. This is what God would have us to do here. Though the world look at us, though the world laugh at us, though the world tell us that we ought to change and, and get up to date and, 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 and get with the times, this is the method that God has given us to do. And this is the method that we will use. Goliath laughed at David's weapons. Many times God asks us to use whatever we have in our, in our hands. For Moses, it was a rod. Remember that? What is in thy hand, Moses? And he asked him to throw it down. It turned into a serpent. You remember the widow that came to Elisha. And Elisha said, what do you have in your house? Well, she said, I have a cruise of oil. He said, bring me the cruise and go get more vessels and bring that in. And God used what, the, what that widow woman had. For David, what he had in his hand was a stick, a staff, and a sling. And God said, use that. That'll do. Right? Now Saul tried to give him a more acceptable suit of armor, more acceptable weapons. But David couldn't use them. Right? Many of the things that, that, um, that we uh, are, are offered as a church, as preachers, we don't, we don't use. Why? Because we're not used to them. They're not, they're not what we ought to use. And so we, we say, you know what? I'm not going to use them. We'll go back to what God has given me, what God has given us in our hand. And the thing that God has given us in our hand is his word. And this is what we're supposed to use. And this is what we're supposed to, to, to run our lives by and to, and to govern this church by and, and all, of those, all of those things. Use what God has given you. Use the talent that God has given you. You know, you may not be able to sing, but you can do something else. You may not be able to do something else, but you can sing. Whatever the case may be, use what God has given you. And God maybe will give you more. 
right? He's given us his word. Use it. Proclaim it. Give it out. Don't be afraid of it. Well, Saul tried to give David a carnal, his carnal weapons. Saul tried to give David something that was more suitable to the task uh, according to his understanding of what he had. But David couldn't use it. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now listen. Listen. It wasn't necessarily that those, wrong, those weapons were wrong. It wasn't necessarily that the, that the armor was wrong. But it was wrong for David. It was wrong for him at that time. God said, you know what? The battle is mine. The battle is the Lord's. You just take what you have in your hand. You take what you're good at. You take what you're, what you're used to. And you go down there and you use it for me. And I will bless that, and I will glorify that, and I will give the victory. You see, David's sling was a real weapon. I want us to, I want us to, to, to recognize something for just a minute. I feel sometimes that we have the wrong idea about David and Goliath. I think we have sometimes the wrong idea of about what exactly happened there. You see, David wasn't just some little boy with a toy slingshot. David went down there with a real weapon. David went down there with something that, that, that uh, was, was useful and good and powerful. It wasn't that it was, God didn't do a complete miracle here, as I've, I've heard a lot of people preach, that this was, there was no way that that slingshot could have, could have, could have um, killed him. Now, why do I make that distinction? I make that distinction just to, to help us to recognize that God has given us some weapons. They're not carnal weapons, but they're mighty weapons. They're weapons that we can use. They're weapons that we can, that we can rely upon. God's word is the weapon that we can rely upon. Prayer is, the, is, is a weapon that we can rely upon. The Holy Spirit is someone that we can rely upon. I want, I want us to, 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 to make that distinction in our minds so that we say, well, there are carnal weapons and there are spiritual weapons. And sometimes we think, well, the carnal are, are really powerful and the spiritual are maybe a little bit mystical and we can't really understand them. And we hope that God can use them and we hope that God will bless them when that's really not the case. The weapons that God has given us are real weapons. The weapons that God has given us are reliable and they're mighty and they're useful for the war that, we, that, that God has given us. What the, the, the differentiation there is that many times the spiritual weapons, we don't, we don't recognize how powerful they are. And David had this sling. It was a real weapon, okay? It just wasn't what Goliath expected to see. And Goliath looked down there and he saw his staff and he saw this sling and he thought, what in the world is that? And you know, the, the, the truth is, is the world is gonna laugh at our weapons, does the world not laugh at our weapons? Right? All, all the time you say, well, this is, that, you're one of those Bible-thumping preachers, or you're, you guys believe in the Bible, and, then, and you guys, really, you'd think of that old book. Is, no, this book is mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, and we can rely upon it. We can rely upon it in our families. We can rely upon it to, 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 to run this church, and we can rely upon it to, to help us in, in times of, of, of trial, in times of difficulty, in times of, we can go to God's, work, to God's word. It is a real weapon, just like David's, um, David's sling was a real weapon. David was, was, young man, was a young man, and he was proficient at using that sling. And he knew his sling and he knew how to hit what he aimed at. And he knew that it was going to be, it was going to be useful. Now I did a little bit of a study about slings. First of all, David was not the only one in the Bible to use a sling. In Judges chapter 20 and verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, and the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities, 26,000 men that drew swords besides the inhabitants of Gebeah, which were numbered 700 chosen men. Among all this people, there were 700 chosen men left-handed 
everyone could sling stones at an hairbreadth and not miss. This was part of Israel's army. This was part of what was normal for Israel. First Chronicles 12 verse 2 says they were armed with bows and could use them both right and left uh, and could use both the right and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of the bow, even of Saul's brethren in, of Benjamin. Second of all, down through history, other armies have used slings, like the Romans, for instance. It's estimated that the Romans could hurl a stone between 60 and 100 miles an hour. Depends on the stone and depends on the person, I'm sure. But you think about it. You think, oh, that's really fast. And I, I was going to try to do some, some physics, but I don't remember enough physics from high school to do that. But you think about the fact that a baseball pitcher can throw a ball at 100 miles an hour, right? Now, obviously, it has to be an exceptional pitcher. Right, but he can he can hurl a baseball, a softball, a, a, a lady softball pitcher can throw that ball at what, ninety miles an hour, something like that. Right now, think about putting a rock in a sling and getting the momentum of that thing going. It's not hard to believe that 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 stone could be running uh, or hurled at a hundred miles an hour. That's not unrealistic. It's calculated that these stones had the same force as a 44 Magnum revolver. That's a lot of force. That's a lot of force. F folks, that was a real weapon. That's my, my whole point in this, is that David went down there with a real weapon, a weapon that he could count on, a weapon that was in his hand, and it was what God had given him to use. Now, I've heard it said that God did a miracle that day that David brought down Goliath. And some have even said that because uh, he fell forward proves that, that it really wasn't the sling that brought him down. It was God. And I've heard even preachers say that God was behind Goliath and he moved him in front of that deal and gave him a push. And so that rock hit him in the forehead and he went face first on his, on his uh, you know, when he died. But think about this. Goliath is coming down out of the mountain, Right. Goliath is, Goliath is nine feet, nine inches tall. Now, what do, you, what do you suppose Goliath weighed? I did a little bit of research, and half Thor Bjornsson, right? Uh, one of the strong men competitors is six feet, nine inches tall. And he weighs 450 pounds, six feet, nine inches. And if you look at him, he has like no fat, I mean, some of those guys are, are big, beefy guys, but 450 pounds, he's tall, and he's, he's slender at the, at the waist, and he is in shape. 450 pounds. Now add three feet to that. How big do you think he was? The Bible tells us that Goliath's brother had six fingers on his hands and six, six toes on his feet. He was a big guy. It's not hard to imagine that he may have weighed like 700 pounds, six, 700 pounds, is it? If a six foot nine inch guy could weigh 450 pounds plus, let's say he was six, 700 pounds. And then the Bible already told us that when that, that Goliath, he told us the weight or the Bible told us the weight of Goliath's armor was well over a hundred pounds. So now you have a man that weighs maybe seven, maybe 800 pounds coming down the side of the mountain, right? It says here, and if I can find where it says in verse 48, it says, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and draw nigh to meet David. Now, I'm not going to say that Goliath was running down the mountain, but Goliath was moving seven or 800 pounds of man and, 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 and armor and sword and, and, and spear coming down the, the mountain. His momentum is going, and the Bible says that Goliath ran out to meet him and grabbed the stone out of his, out of his pouch, and he put it in the sling, and he slung the, the rock, and he hit Goliath in the forehead, and it did, the Bible says that it sunk into his forehead, and he fell flat on his face. What is the point of all this? The point of all of this is that this wasn't necessarily some supernatural, freaky thing of God providing for David. This is David's weapon doing what David's weapon was supposed to do. Now, what does that mean to us? That means to us that the, that the weapons that God has given us will do what it's supposed to do. That's my whole point. It's you, you take God's word and you read God's word and it's not some supernatural miracle that God's word works. 
It's supposed to work. It will work. You can rely upon it working. Just like David slaying. I read on the internet some, some, different, uh, some different articles, and they said that they have found ancient documents that actually told people how to remove the stones from people's bodies that had been hit by the Roman slings. They knew about it. They knew it was a hazard. They, they made provision. They said, listen, you go out to fight the Romans. They're going to hit you with these slings, and those stones are going to go right into your body, and we have to have people who know how to fix you up after that. This was a deadly weapon, right? This is a deadly weapon, if you want to put it that way, right? It's the living word of God. It works the way it's supposed to work, and it always will. We can rely upon it. Now, the world may laugh at God's word, but we can depend on God's word. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Po folks, we don't have to worry about that. Though the world laugh at the man, though the world laugh at the method, we can rely upon it. Number three, the message, and this is short. God gives the victory. Look at verse 46. Verse 46 says, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air. Now, this sounds like David smack talking, doesn't it? It, it sounds like David bragging. But David is just going out there with the assurance that God has already given him that you are going to defeat this Philistine. Is there not a cause? God is with you. God has given you a reliable weapon, and it will be victorious. The message, God gives the victory. Look here at, um, at verse, uh, verse four, the end of 46. It says, And to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. To God be the glory for the victory. To God be the glory. Go Goliath isn't laughing anymore. Do you realize that? Why? Because God gave the victory. Goliath is dead. David slew him. David took Goliath's own sword and cut off his head and hauled it back to Saul eventually, back into Jerusalem. Verse 47, David said, And all this assembly shall know. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and not with spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Everybody looks around and they see the carnal weapons that are out there. They see the things that ought to work. They see the things that, and, 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 and in this, this day and age, we can use all kinds of examples like, like philosophy and psychology and, and, and brute force and strength and, and all of these all of those different, um, th those different weapons that are, are carnal. But God's is mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. That all the world would know that God gives the victory. Not in those things that the world depends on, but in things that God has given us right on our hands. The victory is the Lord's and the, and the glory is the Lord's. Well, Goliath isn't laughing anymore, and neither are the Philistines. The Philistines are running. The Philistines have scattered. The Philistines are getting out of there. Listen, the message that I see here today is that, number one, God is in control. That God is on the throne, and he sends his man or his woman or his boy or his girl to do his work in his way, and the results are predictable. When we do what God has told us to do, the way that God has told us to do it, the results are predictable. David stood up and said, this day, I'm gonna feed you to the birds. And that day, David fed him to the birds. When it's done this way, God receives the glory, and that is the way it ought to be. Just be faithful where God has put you. Just be faithful with what God has given you. And the victory belongs to the Lord. The glory belongs to God. Let's pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. And Lord, I pray that you would help us. Help us to recognize that you are in control, that you give the victory, that you have given us tools and weapons that we can count on, that we can rely upon, that we can put our faith in. And Lord, I pray that you would, you would help us to use them and to be confident in them and, and, and to be the men and women of God that we ought to be. Lord, I thank you so very much for all that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If